I will. I mean, I will. And I can't fail. Ephesians chapter 5, if you would. Great singing today. Most of you. I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. I want that. You just think you out of so much trouble. I mean, I do love pour into trouble. Thank you. Well said. Pour into trouble. I do love singing with God's people, making a joyful noise. And, uh, and I just, the more the merrier when it comes to that. I can't wait um, to be in heaven and, and to know what it's going to be like uh, to sing with all all of God's people, to sing with, with all the Old Testament, uh, all the New Testament, to sing with people who wrote the Bible, uh, to sing with people who will live through and get saved in the tribulation time, to sing with angels, to sing with Jesus. Um, there's just things that are, and I, I know for some, if you're, if you're searching the things of Christ and the things of Scripture and, and and, and maybe you're still coming to faith. Uh, statements like that might feel really religious, but um, when you come to believe and you realize there is a God and the things of Scripture are true, and you come to know Christ as your Savior, that's a reality for me. That's just a, a part of my future. I know it's coming. I know I don't understand everything about it, but I just can't wait. Um, I just can't wait. It's as real as Christmas that is on its way. And now that Halloween is over, we can start singing Christmas stuff. I've already been singing it, and those of you that are bah humbug about that, I'll pray for your soul. Maybe more people can sing, and you'll realize that you can start singing Christmas the day after Christmas. You can start singing it. It's Jesus' birthday, people. Preach, John. That's what I'm doing, Lord. All right, Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians 5, 15. I've been reading this to you in the NLT. Uh, if you want to know, not that you ask, the KJV is a preserved version of the Word of God. If you want to know what I mean by that, I'd love to speak with you on that. Uh, I don't know that it's the only preserved English version of the Word of God. I just know it is a preserved version of the Word of God in English. And uh, the NLT is a version that I read alongside the KJV a lot. And uh, a lot of it I see as an absolute correct interpretation of the Word of God. And sometimes it's easier to understand. So for this series, I've been reading this passage in that because it brings out some clarity that I absolutely love. Uh, and so we've been reading through this series and that, and I'm going to continue to do that because we're talking about redeeming the time. And I love the idea of the word redeeming that the King James brings out in this. And then we're bringing that thought in because something that needs redeemed means that it can be lost. It means that you can, you can lose it and then you have to redeem it back and time can be lost. And all of you in here understand that idea. You've lost time. It's been wasted, and in a way you could say that that's even been evil, that you've frivolously done something with your time that you cannot get back. And I would like to point to the plethora, fantastic word, the plethora of apps that you can download to your phone that's right. that will grab your attention, Candy Crush, <laughs> that you will play, Tetris, and it will consume your time, bubble, whatever bubble game you play, and, and now some of that is absolutely necessary for your brain. You're training your brain. You're defending yourself against what could happen in old age. And I applaud you for doing that. I have played those games. You are waiting for your oil to be changed. And instead of allowing your brain to solidify, petrify, you are playing a game and you're keeping your brain active. Good for you. But when you did that for seven hours that one Saturday, you lost some time that you needed to redeem. That's all I'm talking about. Sometimes we need to redeem time. It'll go away from us. We'll lose it. And we want to we make sure we're using our time. God has given us time. We want to redeem our time. And you can waste time. And so this has become a series of don'ts. It's become a series of things that you don't want to do with your time. I usually preach in the positive, but this series has just lent itself uh, to a series of don'ts. So before we read and recap what we're going through, I just want to go through the last couple of sermons. You can look at them online if God leads you to, and you want to go and look at them. They're on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Uh, you can look them up on YouTube too. Um, but I'm going to go through them. They're all on this one slide that I'm going to start. Here's the don'ts. You can live like a fool. You can so don't. You can make the least of your opportunities. Don't. You can live thoughtlessly. Don't. And you can ruin your life. Don't. These are the don'ts 
that we've covered. We're going to cover two more today. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. If you haven't gotten there yet, it'll be on the screen for you. So be careful how you live. Why? Because you can live like a fool. Don't live like fools. But like those who are wise, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. How did he know 2020 was coming? It's God who's writing this. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. We talked about how that's a tall order. Tall order of pancakes there. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. It's not the only thing that will ruin your life, but it will. And, un, and instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there are two more don'ts that we're going to cover that were there in the last couple of verses. If you missed them, I'm going to point them out to you. We're actually going to take a deep dive into Scripture today, but I don't think it's going to feel too deep to you. Uh, but if it, if it does, we're going to get into pneumatology, which is like a Bible class. And so if somebody asks you what you did at church, be like, oh, well, I went to Bible class. I, I learned theology. And, and you can impress your friends, or maybe not. Um, I just want to ask you this question. Did you have to ask permission for anything when you were a kid? Uh, was there anything that you had to ask for? But if you asked for it, you got it? Like, did you ever figure that out about your parents? So my mom always had a cookie jar. And my favorite cookie jars growing up were a Bert and Ernie cookie jar. Do you guys remember Bert and Ernie? If you do not teach your kids about Bert and Ernie, I think I could scripturally prove to you that that is a sin. I, I would take me a while, but I think I could sit down and, and like, if you do not teach your kids the Muppets, especially now with Disney+, Plus, like, you have no excuse, people. And if you don't know what the Muppets are and you're a parent, learn who the Muppets are and teach your kids the stinking Muppets. I shouldn't say stinking in church. The kids are gone, though, so I can say, like, Bert and Ernie are just the best. They are the best. So we had a Bert and Ernie cookie jar. And Bert was not the fun one. Ernie was the fun one. And I don't want to argue with you today, so I'm going to stop arguing because I've already argued the Bert and Ernie thing. So, so Ernie had chocolate chip cookies in it. My mom liked to mix in other things with her chocolate chip cookies, which I have raised my kids to now do. And, and they understand that white chocolate chips and butterscotch chips and all sorts of other chips should be in with the chocolate chip cookies. Please do not put oats in there, people. Like, I know that I love monster cookies. And, and Tangie, I will let you do this, but none of the rest of you are allowed to do this. Don't put oats in your cookies, people. You know who eats oats? Horses. And I'm not a horse, so don't put oats, don't put raisins, don't do, don't ruin cookies. Eat healthy stuff when it's time to eat healthy stuff and put chocolate chips and white chocolate chips and butterscotch chips and maybe toffee bits and put good tasting things that would kill me if I ate too many of them inside of cookies. So I'm, I'm already behind time. I'm, it's already 1030. Wow. It's not. It's 1029. You got an hour of sleep. You can give me some of that time. So, so all I had to do to get a cookie was ask for it. But if you dare went into Bert or Ernie and you didn't ask, you were like not getting a cookie for a week. But you could sit there and can I have another cookie, Mom? Sure. If you asked, you could have all you wanted. Like that was the rule in the Beeler household. If you just simply asked for a cookie, you were getting a cookie. It was that simple. Like I never tested it, but I know that you could get five cookies. You could ask her five times in a row and she would say yes five times in a row. But even though you knew that she would say yes the fifth time, if you dared just grab one, you were cut off. I mean, you were cut off hard. Like, you were not getting cookies at all for a while. It was just the rule. I don't know why Mary Beeler was raised that way, but that is just how she did it. I, I don't know exactly why God decided that prayer was going to matter to him. I just know there is a verse in Genesis where the Bible says, and in those days men began to call upon the name of the Lord. So there was a time where people didn't pray, and then there was a time where men and women began to pray and call upon the name of the Lord. I don't know that Adam and Eve needed to do it because God visited them in the evening when they were in the garden. So they just talked with God every day. I don't know when that stopped or how that stopped or what went on with Adam's children if they got to do that, because I see God talking to Cain and Abel. So I assume that Seth did. I'm assuming the girls did when they started getting bored. I don't really know how all that worked in the beginning because God decided not to tell us. But he did tell us that there was a day where men and women began to call upon the name of the Lord. And prayer was invented and God decided prayer is going to matter to me. And now there's all sorts of things that God's decided. If you pray, I will. And if you don't pray, I won't. 
So the first thing that we're getting into today here that we haven't yet covered is the Bible says don't ruin your life. And it says don't ruin your life specifically. Don't get drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the first don't today, and, and I'm going to list it in the positive, you can be indwelt with the Spirit but not filled with the Spirit. And this is where we have to dive deep. Now, when a person gets saved, let me just explain this. When a person gets saved, they're going from death to life. When you are born into this world, the Bible says we are conceived in sin. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into politics, but I'm also not going to apologize for the Bible. When a person is conceived, they're a living soul. Amen. At conception, and the Bible says you're conceived in sin. So that living soul at conception is already guilty of sin before it's born. The baby is guilty of sin. And I'm not going to be able to dive into the age of accountability and, and all of those things today. But if a baby dies before that baby is able to reach the age of accountability, we know from Scripture that that baby will be in heaven with God. We know that from Scripture because David has a baby that dies before it's born. And David knows that that baby he will see again with God in heaven. So we have a real clear scriptural evidence of that, okay? But, but for the purposes of what we're talking about today, when a baby is born into this world, that baby isn't born saved, according to Scripture. Not like we are. The baby is born with a sin nature. You don't believe me? Take a toy away from a two-year-old. That sin nature will show up real quick. And eventually that baby gets to an age of accountability where they understand knowledge of good and evil. The sin that Adam and Eve committed in the garden was that they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? So we become teenagers. Let's make it real simple. When you become a teenager, you know right and wrong, and you sin all that you need to sin without anybody telling you what's right or wrong or what's good and what's evil. And those sins that you're committing can only be forgiven by one person, the perfect person, Jesus Christ. And when you get saved, you're not being taken from a bad person and made a good person. That's not what happens. I got saved, and I wasn't a bad person that became a good person. I'm saved, and I still have bad in my life. I was spiritually dead, and I was given eternal life. I go from being dead and I become alive. How does that happen? Well, Jesus says in John chapter 3, you are born again. And I know it's confusing. It was confusing to Nicodemus who he's talking about in John chapter 3. What does it mean to be born again? You are spiritually dead. He gives you eternal life. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. That's when you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Bible also says it this way. You're baptized by the Holy Spirit. The word baptism means immersed. If you're unfamiliar with these terms, I know I'm going quick and I have to go quick. I would love to sit down and exhaustively talk about this with you. It's the most important thing. But the word baptized in the Bible is the same exact word we use for making a cucumber a pickle. That's simple. You dip it into vinegar. You stick it all the way in vinegar and you close the jaw, right? If you didn't know that, you're welcome. That's how a pickle is made. So how does a Christian get made? You're immersed in the Holy Spirit. You receive Christ as your Savior. The Spirit comes to live inside of you. He literally just immerses you. A Christian can't be possessed by a demon. Why? You're already possessed by the Holy Spirit. That's weird. So is the term born again. I didn't make those up. God did. We don't get to make the terms up. So when you get saved, you're, you're born again. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. But here the Bible isn't talking about being indwelt. The Bible being, is talking about you being filled with the Spirit. And it's different than being indwelt with the Spirit. When a believer is filled with the Spirit, things in you become different. And like there's another passage in Scripture that talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, and self-control, and meekness, and, and kindness, and gentleness, and goodness, and faith, and these things that a, that a Christian manifests. A Christian isn't always like that. Boy, if you're always like that, everybody gets saved. Because you really like Christians when they're filled with the Spirit. Unfortunately, we don't always walk around that way, do we? Which is why Christians can be hypocrites, and we all are, because we don't always walk around the way that we should be. Now, I do want to go through, and I'm going to try to go through quickly, um, but I want to go through some advantages to being indwelt with the Holy Spirit. These are things that the Holy Spirit does in a person's life when that person gets saved. Now, the strength at which he's able to do these depends upon your agreeance with him. Some people say it this way, the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He doesn't force himself upon you. He does live inside of you, but he doesn't aggressively just control you. There's a partnership that is at work there. And whichever side of you you feed grows. So the more you give into your sin nature, the more you'll look like a sinner. As a Christian, you'll look like a sinner. And the more you feed the Holy Spirit side of you and the part of you that is now new, and you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, 
the more you'll look like who God wants you to be. And that's why a lot of Christians, it's hard to tell. What, what's going on in you? Why does one day you look like you really love God? And then another day, why do you not? It has a lot to do with your relationship with the Holy Spirit and the way that he's working in your life. So what are some things that happen when you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit? Well, let me just cover this. The difference in the filling of the Holy Spirit, the reason I brought up the cookie illustration, the only thing that, that, that is standing between you and the filling of the Holy Spirit, he is yours for the asking for. Like when you're a Christian and you're like, well, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. You can search the scriptures. There's just not a whole lot about being filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, the most you'll really find about it is right here. And then what it says to be like the fruit of the Spirit talks about that filling. But this is where we find the commandment that we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the, the example is, you know, that you'll be seeing and making money and your heart will be grateful. The filling of the Holy Spirit is, is, is a Christian's for the asking for. I mean, it's, Jesus talks about it in Luke, and he's like, hey, I, your father is a good, good father. And, and, and he's not going to give you a stone if you ask for bread. He's going to give you the Holy Spirit. You just ask for it. It is yours for the asking for. Do you do it? Do you wake up and say, God, I just want to be filled with your Holy Spirit today. I know that I'm already saved. I know that he is inside of me. Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit and just live for me today? I, I want to be yours. I want you to work through me. But be careful because if you ask for it, he's going to do it. And then when you want to be mean to that person that was mean to you, he's going to convict you to be kind. Part of the fruit. When your spouse is unloving to you, he's going to convict you to be loving. Part of the fruit. Well, wait a second. I don't want to be that. I want them to be loving to me. That's selfish, and the Spirit is going to lead you to be unselfish. That's my cheesy smile. Well, the Spirit will lead you to give a cheesy smile to people as well. Look. I mean, I, I, I get it, like, it, 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 it is in self-serving. When you ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it won't feel self-serving. But trust me, it is the best day ever when you live a day filled with the Spirit. You will, you will look, at the, you'll look back at that day and you'll be like, why, why don't I ask for that every day? Because you're a selfish sinner. So am I. You know, if I point you three, at least three fingers back at me. All right, I'm going to keep moving. Indwell with the Spirit. What is indwell with the Spirit? Well, when, when you're indwell with the Spirit, he becomes your counselor and your teacher. Okay? Your counselor and your teacher. I want to read these scriptures to you. You can look back and study this for yourself if you really want to get into this. But this is the pneumatology. So he's a counselor and teacher. John 14, 25 says this. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the Spirit is given to teach you, to counsel you, to give you information, to show you things that you won't understand without it. Let's go to that uh, verse, chapter 16 of John. I have yet many things to say to you, Jesus is teaching, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, talking of the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, which is a real problem with people who say the filling of the Holy Spirit then is like the biggest thing ever. If you look at charismatic churches or those that talk about the gift of tongues, they often overemphasize the Holy Spirit. He is the key thing that they talk about. In fact, sometimes they will say that without the filling of the Holy Spirit, you're not even saved. And yet Jesus himself says the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself. It is impossible that the filling of the Holy Spirit would emphasize the Holy Spirit himself. If Jesus said he doesn't speak of himself, but whosoever he should... Um, but whosoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Let me have that next verse. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and he shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. The Holy Spirit's function when he fills you and he teaches you and he's showing you things is to glorify Jesus Christ. That is what the Holy Spirit does. And so when the Holy Spirit or those that are saying the Holy Spirit is manifesting and showing the Holy Spirit, look, I'm not trying to like condemn all those people. It's not my job to judge them. It's God's job, job, judge, uh, job to judge his servants and to judge his churches. All I'm saying is the truth of Scripture says the Holy Spirit 
the, the action of the Holy Spirit will be to glorify Jesus Christ. The end result will be that Jesus Christ is lifted up. So in these passages, what is being talked about is he'll be a teacher and a counselor. He will show you truth. He will reveal truth. We talk about him as being an illuminator. One of the functions of the Holy Spirit in your life is to help you understand Scripture as you read it and study it. I've often asked God as I'm going in to study the Word of God, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, will you illuminate my mind and help, you, help me to understand what you've written? Now, be careful. This is not a help me to understand it in some fantastical, mystical way. God wrote his Word not to mean something to you that it doesn't mean to anyone else. Proper hermeneutics or interpretation of scripture is that God wrote a book and it means one exact thing. It has lots of applications, but the interpretation is the author's intent. What did God intend for this to say? And that's one thing. But the Holy Spirit can illuminate your mind to understand that one thing and how it applies to your life. And so the Holy Spirit exists to be a counselor and a teacher. He also exists to be an intercessor. Uh, give me that Romans chapter 8 verse, if you would, uh, on the screen. And let me read it to you what it says here. He exists as an intercessor. And here's what the Bible says. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And again, I just need to clear up those that teach this in a false way. This is not spoken. These groanings can't be uttered. So this is in an audible language. This type of when the Spirit is praying for you, if you've ever had this kind of prayer, I've been in this kind of prayer where it is a deep sorrow and you just run out of words. But the Spirit is able to pray for you even when you're in a deep sorrow and you don't know what else to pray. But you're still in that attitude of prayer. He's able to make intercession for you. And the next verse says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So one of the things the Holy Spirit is able to do in our lives is literally to pray for us, knowing what we need, and to pray to God for us. And it's a marvelous thing that he's able to do. Another thing that I love is that he's a seal of ownership. And so if you go back just a little bit, as he's the seal of ownership, a little bit in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says this, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So leave this verse up there for a second. One of the things that I have people come and ask me about is, how do you know that you're saved? And the easiest and first answer to this is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and died on the cross for your sins and rose from the grave? Have you had a time in your life that believing that, you asked Him to save you? If that's true, if you've done that, you're saved. You don't believe your feelings. You don't, you don't look for an experience. You look for an event. You, is there a time in your life that believing Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior who died for you, you ask Him to save you? Because the Bible is our sure word and our assurance, right? right. John 5.13 says things were written for us that we would know that we've received Jesus as our Savior. Amen. That we would know we have eternal life. So we, we believe what the book says. We believe that we did what the Bible said a person does to be saved. Not a work, but, but by faith that we believed in him. But the next question I ask is, does the Holy Spirit work in your life? Because the Bible says that those that are led by the Spirit are the Son of God. So usually when people come to me as teenagers and ask me, how do I know I'm saved? They're battling sin. And sin is making them feel guilty. And that guilty feeling is, well, if I was saved, why would I be battling sin? I kind of ask that question another way. If you weren't saved, why would you care? Amen. I mean, if you're not saved, why would you care that you're sinning? Saved people don't care that they're sinning. I mean, maybe they do because they're moral, right? I mean, maybe you know your sin is a bad thing and you shouldn't do it, but conviction of sin can be evidence that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of sin. What I like to say is, why don't you stop doing that sin and pray and ask God if he is the one convicting you of the sin? Spend a week just asking God, Lord, would you show me whether I'm saved or not? And if I'm not saved, would you convict me that I need to receive your son as Savior? I think that's a prayer God answers. I think God wants people to get saved. I'm pretty sure I could show you a verse where he's not willing that anyone would perish. And so those that are led by God, it's a seal of ownership. The Holy Spirit shows you, hey, you belong to God. I'm here. I'm working. He's not there and working if you're not saved. Also, another verse there is Ephesians 4.30. Give us that one up there. It says this. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Only people who are saved can grieve him when you don't get into his conviction. Whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption. 
A person who is saved will always be saved. This is a verse that we use to show people once you're saved, you're always saved. Because you're sealed by him until the day of redemption. You remember how you make a, a picket? You guys remember that one? You know how like your dad used to be able to seal a jar so tight that you can't open it? Yeah, think of this. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. A saved person is then given a glorified body and you aren't able to sin in a glorified body. This is one of those. Let me keep moving. The last one is a deposit or a guarantee of earnest. Uh, think of earnest money. I want to read this one to you in two different, the same verses in two different versions to kind of show you what I mean about how different versions can help you. So the first, uh, we came James, the second Corinthians verse, if you give us that. It says this. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ, that establishes you in Christ, and hath anointed us in God, who hath also sealed us, there's that word sealed again, and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You think about earnest money. If you've bought a house, so not everybody in here will get this, but if you bought a house, you put earnest money down on that house, right? So that if you don't buy that house, you lose the earnest money. So you've got to put $10,000 of earnest money down on that house, you're going to buy it. Because if you don't buy that house, you learn the earnest money, right? But look at the way the NLT says these same verses. It is God who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ who has commissioned us and he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised to us. I mean, obviously God isn't going to lose the Holy Spirit, right? So he's not going to put the Holy Spirit in you and then somehow lose that part of the Holy Spirit because he doesn't redeem you into heaven. It's just a cool way of looking at what God is doing to make sure that those that he saves, he keeps, and they're guaranteed eternal life in him. So there, you got some new mythology today. You are welcome. You can be indwelt with the Holy Spirit, but not filled. Don't. Don't. Don't be indwelt with the Holy Spirit and miss out on the filling of the Holy Spirit. Well, how do I get filled? It's yours for the asking, Bert and Ernie. It's yours for the asking. Look, I know the new mythology stuff might feel deep, but that's a privilege you have as a Christian that I think you need to know about and you need to exercise and, and get some notes or I'll publish the notes and throw it out in an email this week so you can have those and study and learn a little bit more about your relationship with them. But don't be filled with the whole, don't, don't be indwelt with the Holy Spirit and not seek the filling. Ask for it. Ask for it for the rest of today during the invitation. Ask for it this week and watch the change in your life as you seek to be filled by the Holy Spirit. So here's the last one. You can live an ungrateful life. You can live an ungrateful life. Right? The Bible says this at the end of, of Ephesians 5. Let me just read it to you. It says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled by the Holy Spirit singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can live an ungrateful life. you got lots of reasons for that today, don't you? COVID has you trapped in your house or doesn't have you trapped in your house but everybody thinks you're crazy because you won't stay home, Right? It's got you wearing a mask, and you look so much better without a mask. Or you look better in a mask, and eventually you're going to have to take it off, so you're going to about that. I don't know. I don't know. You know? The person that you want elected isn't going to get elected. That's for half of you. Or not for half of you. I don't know. I have news for you. They're not going to fix it. They're not going to fix everything. Whoever it is, they won't. And half the world's going to be mad and riot. Well, maybe they won't. I don't know. I just... 2021 might be worse than 2020. It might be. You know, the Bible I read, the world's going to come to an end eventually. I don't know when. Maybe we're a thousand years away from that. Maybe we're five. I don't know. I, I just, you, you have lots of reasons to live an ungrateful life. And they had those reasons during the Depression. And they had those reasons like during Vietnam. And we'll have those reasons in the future. And there was the Black Plague. They had those reasons then, right? There was the dark ages. We don't even know all those reasons because they didn't have the internet, so they didn't publish all of the reasons back then. You know, they had those reasons when Jesus came. You think the Romans were better than, than our government? Jesus had to teach them, if the Romans come up and slap you on the face, because by Roman law, they were allowed to do that to the Jews. 
the Romans come and slap you on the face, turn the other cheek. They weren't allowed to do that. They were allowed to slap you once without cause. But they had to have cause to slap you the second time. Did you know that's why he told them to turn the other cheek? They were allowed to come to you and make you walk a mile with them. But he said, go the other mile with them. They were allowed to take a piece of clothing from you without any reason. He said, give them an extra piece of clothing. It's an interesting view of government that Jesus was teaching the Jews. Probably not what they wanted, right? They wanted him to become the government and right. fix everything. Yeah. I just, Daniel was told to not give thanks because a golden image was set up by Darius. And Daniel went and left his windows open. He didn't even close his windows. And he prayed anyway. You would think that God would come to his rescue, wouldn't you? I mean, he prayed anyway. And he got the lion's den for it. Got the lion's den for it. Back in Esther's day, the king didn't like that his wife wouldn't come and party in front of all of his friends. So she was banished. Esther became queen. Mordecai saved the king's life. You'd think they'd be golden, wouldn't you? And Haman, this evil dude that worked for the king, he figured out a plot to kill the Jews. Mordecai's neck was on the line. Esther was afraid to admit she was a Jew. Mordecai was her uncle, cousin. It's complicated, but uncle. Comes to Esther and he's like, hey, if you will say something, we're going to die. And she's like, if I come before the king, I'm going to die. I can't go before the king unless he calls me. Well, maybe God puts you in position for that. He ends up saying, if I die, I die. I better go before the king. It works out. I mean, it's, it's Haman's neck that ends up in the noose. But she didn't know that when she went to the king. And if God would have allowed her to be killed, she would have been okay with that. She made her peace with it. If God doesn't do what I want him to do, I'll be grateful that I didn't serve such a great God. It's not easy, is it? So with Daniel, I say this. What's happening around you doesn't have to overcome what's happening inside of you. You can live an ungrateful life, but don't. Right? Don't. What's happening around you might not change in the next year. Might not. But what's happening inside of you could be greater than that. With Esther, I say this. Remaining steadfast often assures you, us, of our assurances. Like, I can't tell you what's going to happen in our world. It, you know, France yesterday, people were beheaded because of their faith. They were pulled out of the nice church. Nice as a city, by the way. It wasn't a, a nice church. It might have been a nice church. It's a city. And jihadists pulled women out of the church and with a knife beheaded them because of their faith. And that happened. And I don't know what's going to happen in our world as it gets worse or better. I don't know what God's next plan is. I know those of us that really love God are supposed to remain faithful. And we have assurance that if we remain faithful, it is the right and best thing to do. Esther did it. Mordecai did it. And it worked out perfect for them. And... We know that it'll work out perfect for us, don't we? We know the end game, you Avenger fans. We know the end game. We should. And let me leave you with this for all of the don'ts. Don't live like a fool. Don't make the least of your opportunities. Don't live thoughtlessly. Don't ruin your life. Don't be indwelt by the Spirit, but not filled with the Spirit. And don't live an ungrateful life. Because God opens doors that no one can close, and he closes doors that no one can open. He is on his throne. He's right where he's always been, on his throne. And Wednesday morning, he'll be on his throne. And if it takes another three days or three months, uh, you know, he'll still be on his throne. And I think we need to know that. And however God allows you to show it, uh, show it. Show it. There's a lot of people who are going to need to know this. Who are going to need to know that. All right. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.
And uh, let me give you a smorgasbord of invitation this morning. If you're at home, I would just invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes uh, wherever you're at, at home and online. And thank you for joining us. And if everyone here would just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment so no one's looking around. First and foremost, if you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that today. And so I'm just going to ask you to, to stay leaned in and to focus in on the invitation. If you do know Christ as your Savior, I just want to invite you right now to respond to however God wants you to. If there's some way you're living your life and you need to say, God, I'm going to stop living my life that way, I want to invite you to, to make that commitment to him. If it's to be filled with this Holy Spirit in some way or if it is to specifically say, God, I don't want to live in a grateful way or to make some commitment in something today, I just want to invite you to do that. And if you're here and you don't know the Lord as your Savior, whether you're at home or you're here, it is exactly what's been represented today. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, according to Scripture. He lived a sinless life so that when He died on the cross, He could be a perfect sacrifice. So that all of God's holy anger towards sin could be satisfied. That when Jesus died and shed His blood on the cross, it would be a sufficient payment so that you and so that I could be forgiven of our sins. Jesus died on that cross and he was buried and he rose from the grave. And he declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He said, I am the door. And if any man will enter in, he will be saved. Jesus said, if anyone will believe in me, he can come to the Father. The Apostle Paul said that all are sinners and fallen short of the glory of God. He said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he said if we will confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we would be saved. And if you don't know him as your Savior, and you'll believe in him and what he did for you, and you'll ask him to save you, then in this very moment, wherever you are, he will forgive you of your sins and he will save you. So if you don't know him, but you do believe in him, and you haven't asked him to save you before, I would invite you in this moment to receive him as your Savior. You don't have to say any exact words, but if you need something, if you need to know what to say, and you want to pray, and you want to ask him to save you, I'd invite you to say a prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I need a Savior. I believe you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross and shed your blood for my sins. I believe that you were buried and that you rose again from the grave. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins, to come into my heart, and to save my soul. Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. Amen. God Almighty, we love you and we just thank you for the day. Thank you for your word and for its truth. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray, Lord, if anyone here today, God, this scene online, just perceived your son as your Savior. God, I pray that you'd be very near to them. Lord, I thank you for their decision. I thank you for eternal life. I pray you'd help them to reach out and to share that decision with someone today. That you might help them to reach out to me and that I'd be able to celebrate with them and encourage them in that decision and other steps that you might take them help them to, to take God. We just rejoice and thank you for your salvation and thank you for that gift. Thank you for DJ today and the decision that she made and for us allowing me able to, to celebrate with her and, and for her for her just uh, making it public, God. I pray you continue to help those that have been saved, Lord, if they need to take a step of baptism, that you lead them in that, Lord, and give them the, 
uh, just that chance, Lord, and that courage to be able to make the, the decision public. God, I thank you for every person today here that's heard the message, that's made a decision to take a step closer to you in whatever way they have. God, I pray you just help us with our lives to take heed to this uh, passage of Scripture, God, that we would redeem the time, that we wouldn't live like fools, that we would make the most of every opportunity, God, that we wouldn't live thoughtlessly, God, that we wouldn't do anything that would ruin our lives, but we would live filled with your Holy Spirit, God, and that we would live lives that are grateful and thankful for all the things that you are doing. That at this time especially, we would just, we would be yours, God, that we'd be light and salt, and that we might just live lives that really have meaning in your life, that we would trust you to give us the courage and encouragement we need in this time. We pray you continue to be with our nation, Lord, that you be with us as we go our separate ways, and that you would just uh, bless us now, God. Thank you for this day and all the great things you've done in our midst. We do love you, God, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' precious name, all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here today. You are